2023, I'm going to be popping these things. Again, we don't have... If anybody is, is Facebook savvy um, and would like to help us, we would like to recreate... We've had a Facebook page, but we, shut, we shuttered it. Um, and so now we, we're looking to rebuild that. And uh, so because we don't have access to that, this type of stuff would get posted onto Facebook. Uh, in time to come. But again, we're paper pen people right now, so I've put together uh, for today, it's called Shame is a Soul Leading Condition of the Heart, and just some thoughts that you can think through. And so that's available at the back for you as well. So what is shame? Last week we saw that shame is really the, the kind of the residue of sin. We commit sin but then there's this residue that comes with sin, and it's called shame. Both our own, um, as well as the sins that others have committed against us. And we also discovered last week that shame is the subjective feeling of an objective truth uh, or a reality that sin has damaged our lives. There's just no doubt about it, right? <laughs> uh, no doubt about it. And so with the, our sin, often comes our shame... And with our shame, it leaves us feeling unsafe. And most of all, shame makes us feel very, very, very inadequate. We also noted last week that shame is a very difficult issue. For one thing, shame isn't black and white. Guilt is black and white. So if I, if I do 50 kilometers an hour through a school zone... Um, I'm, and there's a person on the other end of that with a blue light uh, that picks me off. I'm guilty, right? I've, I've, and I'll pay the fine. And if it depends how fast I'm going, uh, there will be a demerit or who knows what. So I'll deal with it, right? But shame is different than that. Um, it's, it's difficult. It's not black and white. We're either guilty or not. That's true. But shame isn't like that. Shame can be because of what you did. It can be because of what you didn't do or what others did to you or what others didn't do to you. So all of that's just for starters, right, in this whole thought field around shame. But there's another problem with shame. Shame is like a weed. Uh, there's some gardeners here. Uh, I, in Chilliwack, I don't know, I wish I knew what this weed was called. Um, but it, it grows up, it has a beautiful little flower, and then it goes whoosh, like this. Um, yeah, maybe that's what it is. Anyways, I go over to the plant, and I pull it up, right? And the, the root is long, like the main root is long, and when the ground is soft, it comes seemingly right out, not too bad. So when I was home in Chilliwack over... Christmas, uh, I was cleaning up a little bit in the backyard, and so there was, I, I pulled some weeds, and because it was very moist, um, when I began to pull this thing up, the roots on those things went, and that's like shame. You think you got it, right? And then, oh, out of the blue, it, there's more. And, and you can think you've got it, but then it comes right back. Dandelions, as we know, are probably what we would think are the worst. Because I can, I can even go to Canadian Tire, and, and I did, actually, and I bought the big thing that goes in, you torque it, and it pulls it up by the root. It, it doesn't work. Um, in the little ones, it does. In the big ones, it just snaps the root uh, because that thing still keeps going down. So you see, it just keeps coming back and back again. And that's what shame does. It just keeps coming back and back and back. And sometimes we've got these daily voices, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But where do those things come from? And so it's tempting to think that we can somehow eliminate shame from our life. And I think it's futile to actually wish for that, friends. Because I think if, if Dr. Roberts was here today, I would like to have him perform brain surgery and excise my shame from my brain, but and I'd be dead. So um, we have to actually grow, I think, in our 
confidence in being able to combat shame. Because in my experience, as I would, I'm assuming in your experience as well, we do not execute shame by some kind of behavioral guillotine and chop it off. It just doesn't happen. But I think rather we end up starving it over time, not by avoiding shame, but by actually welcoming shame into a bigger story that is bigger than just yours and mine. And so here's what shame tells us. Shame says, John, you're not good enough. Like, really? Like, who do you think you are getting in up in front of church and preaching on shame? Shame on you. John, there's something wrong with you. You have de- Who on earth, given John your sinfulness and given your pride, who is it do you think can lead a church? Really, John? You're not that competent. You're not that good. You're a failure. Uh, Look at all the failures of your past in the wake of that. Um, John, you're bad. You're you're really bad. Uh, uh, John, you're flawed. You've got massive deficits in your life, bro. Who do you think you are? You know what, John? You don't really matter. Your, Your life in the big scope of this universe... It's pee on. You see, to be human, quite frankly, is to experience shame. It's something all of us carry, and it keeps us from living with freedom and being able, it limits us from being able to make our maximum contribution for the kingdom. It really does. And shame, if it isn't dealt with appropriately, will lead us to passive suicide. And so to help us today, we're going to look at the most powerful story in the entire Bible that talks about shame. Because I think this story will help us understand ourselves in a profound way that tells us that not only about what's going on in the depths of our soul, but it helps us to know how to deal with it when it pops up and shows itself. And so today as we explore this story, I want to identify and help us understand three things. You probably won't remember them because I understand human nature and being able to remember things. But first of all, we're going to look at why do we experience shame. Secondly, why there's a a deeper level to our shame than most of us really understand. And then thirdly, we're going to discover what God has done about it um, and how he resolves it for us. So why on earth do we experience shame? If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Zechariah, chapter 3. Um, Zechariah is the second last book of the Old Testament. I think it's the second last. Yeah, it's the second last book of the Old Testament. Um, it's, it's about not quite three quarters of the way through, so depending on where you're opening it to. But Zechariah, chapter 3. Let me try to set the scene for you here. Zechariah was a prophet of God who lived around the time of 520 BC. Um, He lived right around the time that, if you remember back a few message series ago, uh, to to the children of Israel who were exiled from Jerusalem and taken into Babylon. This guy was one of those people that was taken to Babylon. And Babylon was not a nice place. (laughs) It was a horrible place. And so uh, Joshua here, uh, or Zechariah rather, who wrote this book, uh, was returned along with the exiles back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple and the city. You see, it was a time for a second chance for God's people. And I love that. Because even for you and me today, God is the God of second chances. And the God of third chances. And the God of fourth chances. And fifth chances. Aren't you glad? I'm so glad. Because the reality is, would the people of God be able to know how to deal with it? 
Well, in the context, Zechariah here in chapter 3 receives a vision or a dream, a vision in a dream. Um, and it's a very profound dream. Zechariah sees a scene in heaven. And standing in heaven is a guy by the name of Joshua. Not the Joshua who fought the Battle of Jericho, but the Joshua who was the high priest. And the high priest was standing before God. So the job of a high priest is to represent the people of God before God. Um, And once a year, the high priest was to do something that they feared and trembled to do. Because the high priest was responsible to provide the sacrament and the obligations of, for the sins of atonement for the people of God. It was a very serious job that they had because if they didn't do it right, they could be wiped out immediately. And so the high priest had to do a ton of work to make sure that before he enters into the holy chamber, um, he better make sure that his heart is right with God, that he is clean, and, and that he puts on these pure vestments or clothings or cloaks to wear into the presence. They had to be absolutely, brilliantly cleaned with Mr. Clean. I don't know what they use, but anyways... Whatever cleaning agent they had, they had to be pure, bleached almost, as it were, uh, purified. And so the high priest would go through a few weeks of trembling because if they step out of line, they don't want to get snuffed out. And there was a history there that some of these high priests got snuffed out. And so here's Joshua coming. Sorry, I'm creating a little bit of stat, um, feedback here. I'll move my thing. Um, Earlier in Leviticus <coughs> chapter 16, it says that if the priest went in not fully prepared, he would die. And so these cleansing rituals were, were critical. And so now, he's already done that. And he is now standing in the courtroom of heaven. And in verse 1 of chapter 3, it says, Then he, the angel, showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. In verse 3, here's the weird part. Now Joshua was standing before the angel, clothed with filthy garments. Doesn't quite make sense, does it? Um, If the priest had actually done his preparatory work, of being cleansed and all of that, then why would he now be standing here with filthy garments? So I think the term filthy garments is actually a bit of a, a, of, of a euphemism because the, the word in Hebrew actually refers to the word excrement. We have a four-letter word that we use today for that, which I won't share. Um, excrement. So get the picture. Here's, here's Zechariah in the courtroom of heaven, and he is covered head to toe in excrement. It's not like he just stepped into some dog poop on his way in to the chamber. He's covered. What a picture. Let that visual kind of sink into your brain if you can. Because there's a lot of truth, not only for him, but for us here today. Because this is how we ourselves must look um, before God. As we come before him with all of our righteous goods, right, that we've done. You see, after all the preparations we can do, we can go to school and get an education, and we can get a 4.0 average, and we can get a job, and we can be the very best at what we do. We can be kind to the old lady helping her across the street every day. We can make sure that the neighbor's lawn is cut. Um, we can make sure that we're shoveling their snow for them. Um, we can be doing all kinds of good things. 
We can be an upstanding citizen in our community. We can be elected to the, the role of, of mayor uh, because of how awesome and amazing we are. And God looks and he pukes because we're standing in filthy garments as God sees us because God couldn't care less about what we do or how good we look because here we are standing before God covered in, you guessed it, excrement. So this tells us a lot about our guilt, doesn't it? Listen to what God says in Isaiah chapter 64. He says, all of our amazing good deeds are like a polluted garment. All of our good deeds are like a polluted garment. Why? Because we're, fel we're filthy and we're foul and no amount of good things we do can ever make up for all the crap that we have and are. And it doesn't matter how pompous or holy we try to look, we still have this stench before God. But this isn't just about guilt here, friends. There's that for sure. But this is also about shame. Think about how Joshua, the high priest, would have felt at this moment. Unfit, condemned, dirty, inadequate. And after all that he's done, he thought to be good and upright and holy before God, it comes as nothing. He's still covered. But that's not all. We need to see something else. We need to see why there is a deeper level, why there's a much deeper issue at stake here for Joshua as there is for us. So look what happens at the end of verse 1. Satan is standing right beside the angel, pointing the finger and going, look at this screw-up. Well, he's accusing Joshua, a holy man. Now, it's bad enough, right, to be standing before God in the guilt of our sin. It's really bad when somebody's there to point it out how bad we are. And I think that's our experience, too. We suffer from two conditions in this world. We suffer from guilt, and we suffer from shame. We are guilty before God. And we subjectively feel our unworthiness before him. And Satan is right there, right beside him, attacking and accusing us. And he's going, what? John, you screwed up again. You jerk. You're no good. God could never love somebody like you. You're pathetic. Have you had any of those words ever course through your brain? <laughs> oh, my goodness. I think we all have. How many times have you heard those statements ringing in your head? And that, those words are words that don't come from God. Those are words that come from Satan, the accuser. He's our accuser. Revelation, if we were to read uh, at the end of the book, um, it refers to Satan as the accusers of the brethren who accuse them day and night before God. Can you imagine that? Day and night. <sighs> Satan goes, I got them. I got them. They think they're a child of God. They think from their mother's womb they've been chosen. No. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put them down. I'm going to take them out at the knees. You see, Satan loves to point out our flaws. He loves to point out our shortcomings. And here's the thing about it, friends. He ain't wrong. He's not wrong. We are sinners. We have flaws. We are screw-ups. And he can point it out. We do stink. But the subsequent result of embracing those words of the accuser is that we end up standing or sitting, as the case may be, in our shame. There's an old preacher from another day by the name of Charles Spurgeon, a great British preacher, and he describes Satan's accusations this way. He said, numberless, numberless 
are the strategies which Satan uses to obstruct our progress and to dampen our hopes. Satan represents to the believer's mind the enormity of their sins and the subsequent ills that they are just too great to be forgiven. God, you can never forgive me. He proclaims them as proofs. Look at that. God has not chosen him and that therefore to seek for mercy is a hopeless task. It's on the account that Satan is called the accuser of the brethren because he accuses them to God and God to them and for sure accuses them also to themselves in order to bring them to despair. So remember, in our story here in Zechariah 3, this is a courtroom scene. The high priest is there in the courtroom covered in excrement. And the prosecution, Satan, has got an airtight case. He's got it. He's pointed out the obvious. It's witnessed by everybody who's present. And there is no higher court. The Supreme Court of Canada has got nothing over this court of heaven. And there he stands. It's devastating. It's horrifying. There is nowhere to hide. And the minimum penalty, according to God's law in Leviticus, is for Joshua to be expelled or to be cut out or to be, get out of my sight. That was the minimum. And as I've alluded, we too, like Joshua, have an accuser. We have an enemy. And this means that your shame is not simply a matter of recovery from self-talk, positive self-talk. I I wish we could just read a book to deal with our shame or to use positive psychology or to take a pill. And many of those things may help momentarily soothe the symptoms, but they do not take care of the problem. They don't go far enough. Because our problem is that we don't just have to change the voices in our head because we're not the only one condemning ourselves. We have an accuser. And his name is Satan, and he is there day and night before God saying, John is a jerk. John is a jerk. John can't do anything right. There he goes. He screwed up again. And not only is he saying that to God, but he parks those thoughts into my ears as well. And he loves it. He loves to keep us bound in our shame. See, he gets great joy out of standing there and going, ha ha, another failure. Another one falling short. And then he loves to rub our noses in our shame and in our excrement. And that is why shame is such a big issue. Because shame operates not here in our head space. Shame operates here in our heart space. It goes right to the core of our DNA. But there's good news in this story. I love good news stories. It's really good news. God's done something about it. And so what has he done? And so let's hear what God did. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this the man, a burning stick plucked from the fire, referring to Joshua? And the angel said to those who were standing before him, Remove the filthy garments from him. And to Joshua he said, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you in a special robe. And the Lord said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. And so they put a clean turban on his head, and they clothed him with garments. Interesting. The very same thing that God did for Adam and Eve. And the angel of the Lord was standing by. This is not at all what I would expect. So look what happens in our story. First, God shuts Satan down. He just shuts him down. Boom! God did it. One word. I rebuke you. Well, it's a few words. I rebuke you. When Satan accuses you, of which he will do today, probably a hundred times before this day is out, 
you don't have to defend yourself. Because somebody already has, right? Somebody's already done that for you. Understand this. Satan, who is the second most powerful being in the universe, okay? Who are we to stand up against Satan? He'll crush us. He'll crush us. It's pretty, we're pretty important to stand up against him. But only the one who has greater power, only the one who actually made Satan in the first place can do that. And we find out later who that is, and of course it is our friend Jesus, because Jesus is the legal and the moral advocate of all of those who put their trust in him. Friends, whenever Satan begins to make a case against you, Jesus is making a case for you. You cannot lose. You cannot lose. It is guaranteed, and it is written in red. I have overcome. 1 John puts it this way. He says, if anyone does sin, uh, can I see your hands here? Come on, be on it. All right. If anyone does sin, and Satan is there going... We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Friends, you have an advocate. He's walking with you every day. He's standing with you, and he is standing for you. And therefore, as Paul says in Romans, we therefore now have no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. I'm not assuming you know a lot about church history. I'm, I'm not really a great church historian. But I can tell you that one of the most colorful characters in all of church history is a man named Martin Luther. And if you know anything about him, you know that he struggled deeply with a guilty conscience and a deep, deep deep-seated insecurity. But he also knew the truth of the defender and that he had one. And so this is his advice that he gave people who were struggling when they felt the accusations of Satan coming their way. He said this, So when the devil throws your sins in your face and declares that you deserve death and hell, tell him this, Yes, Satan, I admit, I deserve hell and I deserve death. What of it? For I know the one who suffered and made satisfaction on my behalf, and his name is Jesus Christ, Son of God, and where he is, there I will be also. Luther later wrote, I think, what is probably one of the greatest hymns or songs of all time. We often don't remember that Luther was a good hymn writer, but I won't sing it for you. But I will repeat the lyrics. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe, Satan, does seek to work us woe. His craft and his power are great. And armed with cruel hate on earth, none is his equal. Did we in our own strength confide? Our striving would be losing. We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. You ask, who, who might that be? Christ Jesus, it is he. Lord Sabaoth, your name, from age to age the same, and he must win the battle. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God has willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness, grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. That word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abideth. The spirit and the gift are ours through whom who with us sideth. Let goods and kindreds go. This mortal life also, the body they may kill. (laughs) God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. Wow. 
when you have a hundred voice choir singing that song, it sends shivers all over your body. And so friends like Martin Luther refuse to be abused by your abuser any longer. Refuse. Stand free from shame and abuse of Satan and others who work on his behalf because he's not the only one up there chattering. There's people around you that chatter to and judge you and put you down. And so if I could say hashtag me too. Today, God wants you to know that you have authority as his child. Not yours, but his. And he has given it to you. Remember in the New Testament, the story of the woman who was caught in adultery. Do you remember Jesus' observations just prior to the community's attempts to stone her for her transgression? And, and he says to her, woman, where, where's your accusers? Huh? Because Jesus had just moments earlier dismantled the power of shaming words that were about to be hailed upon her. And Jesus restored this woman's dignity, and he's restoring yours too. Remember, you don't defend yourself. You have a defender. Uh, I love it at the, just in, walking into the Evangelical Free Church this past week for a memorial service. They have banners like we have here, and one of the words is defender. <laughs> I saw that goal. Oh, that does my heart good. Defender. That's who Jesus is. Agree with God. Don't agree with Satan. Secondly, God redefines who we are. I love it. We need to tell the story, a new story about ourselves. We, Satan just wants us to rehash the old one because it's so messed up. But we have a new story, and it's a new story that we can believe because God says that Joshua, there's a strange phrase here, is there not? He's a stick plucked from the fire. Seems like kind of a passing thought that makes no sense to the story, but it actually makes a lot of sense to the story because it means that Joshua had been in the fire. And where was the fire? Remember, he was exiled back in Babylon where not good things were happening to God's people, including him. But God had pulled him out. God had rescued him. God had restored him and brought him back to a land of hope and to a land of healing. And see, he's charred. When you pull a stick out of a fire, um, it still isn't green um, and perfect. It's got, the bark is burnt on it a little bit, and sometimes if you pull it, there's still some embers uh, that are on the end of it. And he's charred, and he's a little bit polluted, and he's scarred, but the fire's gone out. As soon as you take that twig out of the fire, it will go out. And God is saying to us, I have taken this person out of the fire of sin and out of the fire of death and hell. And the condemnation is gone. The guilt is gone. And the pollution <laughs> remains. But you're now free. You are free. And him whom the Son has set free is free indeed. Friends at Terrace, that's, that's us too. If you look at us, as we continue to get to know each other's stories, we're all a little bit charred. Nobody's made it this far in life completely in pristine condition, guaranteed. But we've been pulled from the fire. And not only that, the condemnation and the guilt and the shame is gone. It's gone. That's what God has done for us, to be remembered no more. But God does a third thing, and he reclothes them. The word is given, and the clothes that are covered in excrement are taken off Joshua. Do you notice something here in the story? Joshua didn't take off his own clothes. The angel took off his clothes. See, we cannot take off our sin. We cannot take away our own excrement. That can only be done by the gracious hand of of our God. And in their place, he has given pure, clean clothes, new clothing. And they even put a new turban on his head. But here's what's really interesting, I think. The angel didn't just put the dirty clothes in the washing machine and hand them back to him. 
He isn't reclothed in the same similar priestly garments. He's reclothed now in kingly garments. You see, you and I shower probably every day, um, or thereabouts, and we reclothe ourselves, hopefully every day. Why? So that we're clean. And God, by his Spirit, washes over us, and he reclothes us with the garments of salvation that are not ours, but his, so that we can be like kings. You see, he has placed us now in a family, and we come into his direct presence without shame, and how is it that we can walk into his presence without shame? Because it's not what John is carrying in to his presence. It's what Jesus has put on me that allows me and you to have conscious contact with God. No other way. None of us are good enough to stand before God. We can only stand before God in the goodness and grace of God through his son, Jesus. And so we come into his presence without shame because we are now the righteousness of Christ. You're wearing his clothes, not yours. The accuser's been silenced. One word will fell him. Get behind me, Satan. You've been snatched from the fire. You've been reclothed. You're clean. Now you can actually breathe. Doesn't it feel good to breathe? Breathe in his grace and his goodness. You see, you now rest in the unforced rhythms of his grace. The prison room of shame is no longer yours to live in. And so just like Joshua, who needed a new story, we need a new story too, rather than the one that shame has been speaking into our lives, most of our lives. You see, here's the story that shame has been telling you. Shame has been telling you, you're covered in excrement. You can't be loved. You've done too much that is wrong. And not only that, there's something wrong with you. You are deeply and irrevocably broken and flawed. That's shame's message. <laughs> now the new story, the true story that God is now telling you today, and this is the story that I want you to embrace. Satan is silenced. God will not tolerate him telling the same old lies about you day after day after day. You have an advocate. And he has given his life for you. And he pleads your case every single day. Remember that. When you begin to feel the attacking shame statements of Satan, know that Jesus is already standing there going, no, Satan, you don't have him. You don't have her. They're mine. Your shaming message, gone. Why? Jesus has already paid for it and covered it all. Oh, you may be charred, you may be scarred, but that's only a sign that you've been actually plucked from the fire. <laughs> you didn't get burned up, and you've been rescued. And never forget that you're reclothed, and that you are in this very moment standing perfectly righteous and good standing before God. And now you not only have what you need, you are royalty too. You have way more than you need. He has given you more than you need because you are a part of his family and that will never, ever, ever change. That's my story. And if you're in Jesus, it's your story too. Absolutely. It's a story to anyone who wants it. We have to make a choice. We have to make a decision. Am I going to rest in Jesus and trust him to take away my sin, to remove my shame? Or am I going to carry on in the pollution and then the stink and then the stench 
Friends, you don't have to do that anymore because Jesus has come to liberate you. He's come to set you free. So, Father God, I don't know where we are today in our hearts, condition of our hearts. We're all sinners. That's not news to you, and that's not news to us. And we fall short of the glory of God daily, I'm sure. And sin so easily ensnares us. We can get trapped. And at times we're trapped and we don't even know it until the stench of our shame begins to rise and we begin to judge ourselves. But I'm asking in these sacred moments as we are here in the courtroom of heaven, knowing that we're standing before God, and that we know that Satan is here too. That's, that's a given. That doesn't worry us. Because we know that you have overcome. And so, Father, I pray blessing into your people today. I pray that they would turn their lives over to your care, that they would come and make a decision. Again, we've probably made it a thousand times, and we will continue to make it again. And so today we choose to follow you. Today we choose to say our yes to you. And so, Jesus, we stand whole and complete, not because of our works of righteousness that we have done, but according to your mercy, you saved us by the washing of the blood and the regeneration of the Holy Spirit. And so, Father, I pray that you would lift shame out of this room, that you would send it to the deepest, darkest recesses of hell from where it came, because it didn't come from you. And Father, may we stand complete in you. There may be some of you that need to chat because you've just been so overwhelmed by the chaos of your life. You just want a helpful partner to share with or to pray with you. Remember, there's no shame. There's no shame. If you want to come and have someone pray with you, First few pews are open here, and we would love to have some folks share with you and pray with you. Um, if you know you need to come and talk, and you're choosing not to come and talk, you're letting shame control your decisions. Don't let shame control your decisions. It's the worst thing that could ever happen, because it'll just keep you locked in. Jesus has come to set you free. And so let's stand together as we celebrate our affirmation um, of life together.